Yeah, you can use French on the air, of course, of course. Uh, would I like to have a QSO with you in French? I took one quarter of French in college, and all I learned to say was, je ne sais pas français. Hello, Augies Worldwide. By the way, what I said about French means I do not speak French. And I tried that for a quarter and got nowhere with it. So anyway, there you are. Today's question from Antoine Panetier. F4IYF, that's French station. This unfortunately is one of those four-year-old emails that got stuck in cyberspace. Okay, for a long time. So I'm sure he's already solved his question, but other people might have the same question. I see in all the answers about grounding and lightning arresters that you recommend to put the arrestor just before the entry in the shack through the wall. Yes. In my situation, I have three coax cables, each 80 feet long, starting inside from the tuner, then go outside along the wall. This is outside along the foundation wall to a box where I have my three arresters and it's the starting point from there to the antennas. Just outside the shack, I have a ground rod and another one at the box. All the rods are bonded together and so on. Do you think it's okay to remote the arresters 80 feet away from the shack like this? I'm a new operator and don't really see why the arrestor should be the closest to the shack. Thanks for your answer. Best regards from France. This book right here, which you can get from the American Radio Relay League, and a, an equivalent of it is probably available from your National Amateur Radio Association. The Radio Society of Great Britain would also sell a book like this. This is the second edition of Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur, and you can consider this the Bible for amateur radio best practices for grounding and bonding. Bonding means connecting different grounds together. Get this, the National Electric Code is made legal. It's just a code written by the National, are you ready for this? The National Fire Protection Association, NFPA. Why would the fire people write a book about electrical code? Well, guess what starts a lot of fires? And so they have this code book and it is very definite on how things should be done. It's not Oh, kind of achieve these goals or this. It's very specific. And there are sections in there having to do with radio stations. Also, there is a book put out by Motorola, which talks about grounding and bonding for remote radio stations, like on mountaintop. Have you ever wondered how a radio station with an antenna on a mountaintop can get hit by lightning all the time? And it doesn't even make the station pause. It's because it follows those recommendations, okay? And like I said, a lot of local codes, like here in Uray County, take that, the National Electric Code, and say, you must. And it becomes then the law within your local jurisdiction. And breaking that law is breaking the law. And you've got to do what you need to do. Now, in a lot of places in the United States, there are only two people allowed to do any electrical work on your home. One is a licensed electrician. Two is you. Not every jurisdiction allows you, but a lot do. You can do your own, but you need to pull a building permit and you need to have it inspected before you energize it, okay? And that's very important to do because inspectors can get very sticky about things. I remember when I put in some plumbing for an old fashioned dark room in my basement, I used half inch copper line for water instead of three quarter. And the inspector said, no, no, you got to take that out of there and put three quarter in, in these places. And I went, yes, sir. And did it and got my inspection, enjoyed my dark room for several years before we moved down here and went all digital. Okay. Now, why? Do we put the lightning arrestor right where the cable goes into the house? It is because we want to keep the lightning outside. And if you've got 60 feet of cables up against the wall, they are subject to lightning. A lightning little spike can hit those things and that goes straight in to 
into your radio room. You do not ever want to invite lightning into your home. So, yes, you need to put another box in right outside your house. Put those lightning arresters right there, grounded right to that ground rod, and come straight in to the wall. I have such a box on the side of my house, and the cables come directly into the house after going through the lightning arresters. So, no, I do not recommend what you are doing. You need to move those lightning arresters to keep lightning outside the house, okay? You can reconnect those cables to each other with barrel connectors or something. That's fine. You can ground those if you want. That gives you another point of keeping RF, RFI, radio frequency interference, or common mode currents from coming in the house. So, yes, again, do it this way. Otherwise, some electrical inspector in your neighborhood who happens to see that out there might come knocking at the door and say, hey, you've got to change that, okay? I suggest proactively changing it. I took a look through the lightning death statistics in the United States for like the past 20 years, 25 years or so. And yes, they do keep these statistics. Getting killed by lightning is very rare. But it does happen. If you're in a car, you've got this nice insulator between the metal parts of your car and the ground. Okay, so even though your car is hit by lightning, it might shatter the window or something like that, you're somewhat protected from that. If you're playing golf in a lightning storm, you're inviting a lightning strike. Okay, you've got a lightning rod right up above you there. In my review of those statistics, to my surprise, I found that there was never a death of someone who was inside of a building, okay? This is why we come indoors during lightning strikes. You want to stay away from wired telephones. You want to stay away from your ham radio equipment. In fact, if the lightning storm is coming, you know, all this lightning protection is great, but if you've got a direct strike, all bets are off. And I've had a direct strike, and I know what it sounds like, and called how to jump six feet in the air from nap position when lightning hits. It is very loud. So go ahead and get another uh, metal enclosure right where the cables go into the house. Put your lightning arresters there, properly grounded, and then take the rest of that cable out and put a barrel connector on it there. Wrap it with waterproof tape so you don't get water in there. It's a lot wetter in France than it is out here in the Great American Desert. So uh, anyway, and again, this book is your Bible for how you do that. And it's not a case of well, I can meet the intent. It's you are in conformance or you are not. Now, let me just give you one rather frightening scenario. If you are hit by lightning and there is a problem with the lightning, you know, you've got 40 or 60 feet of that cable exposed. If it hits that, goes through that, comes into your house, causes damage, your insurance provider may refuse to pay if you have added wiring that is not to code. When I had my box put in out here, I actually hired a licensed electrician to put the ground in and stuff like that. He was much more used to dealing with boxes on the sides of houses to know where to put them, to know how to punch through the wall and do all of that sort of thing. So I had a licensed electrician do that. I've got my lightning arresters on there on every antenna. You know, I've always got more work I want to do, but in the case of this, if you can point to, I did it according to this, widely considered best practices for amateur radio, there was still some incursion, but I minimized it best I could by following best practices. You have a much better case with your insurance company. So I know that sounds kind of serious, and it is, but I would like to encourage you to do that. Another thing you can do if you want is have a licensed electrician come and survey the way you have all your RF stuff laid out, including towers. You kind of have to live in the country in Europe to have room for a tower, but a lot of people do, I guess. We have a special going on that also works for people in France. If you go to Patreon and become a patron of this channel, go to patreon.com slash ke0og. There's a $2, $5, $10, $20 level monthly that you can be a patron of this channel. Most people, of course, are $2 members. If you join as a $2 or above member, we will send you your first month a thank you in the form of a genuine U.S. $2 bill. 
These are fairly rare. They're not in circulation very much. Most of the ones that you get are nice and crisp because people don't tend to use them. They tend to save them up. It's like the old Kennedy half dollars. When they printed Kennedy's face on that coin, everybody saved those coins instead of spending them. And now 50 cent pieces are not in common circulation in the U.S. So anyway, there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.